Hello, I am Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Stephen M. Kellen lecture entitled Rethinking Work, Meeting the Challenges of the Robot and AI Revolution, which will be delivered by Professor Benjamin Friedman. <clears throat> First, uh, a word about the man for whom this lecture is named, Stephen Kellen. For those of you who don't know the Academy well, Stephen Kellen and his wife, Anna Maria Kellen, were the absolutely essential movers behind the establishment of our institution. And today we find ourselves in the home of Anna Maria's parents, Hans and Ludmila Arnold. Stephen Kellen was born in Berlin and raised here, but was forced to leave the city in 1936 because of his Jewish ancestry. And yet he remained deeply committed to this city for the rest of his life. He showed both vision and courage after World War II by being one of the very first financiers to grasp the imperative of getting Germany's major corporations back on their feet, as well as such cultural institutions as the Berlin Philharmonic. In the 1990s, when Ambassador Richard Holbrook brought the idea of the American Academy to Stephen Kellen and to Anna Maria, he immediately grasped, that is to say Stephen Kellen, immediately grasped the value of the idea, and he and Anna Maria provided the founding gift for the renovation of the American Academy uh, in 1994, and today the building in which we meet is the Hans Arnold Center. The Kellen Arnold family has remained deeply and very generously involved in the Academy to this day, and we are profoundly grateful for their support. This particular lectureship has been endowed since 2004 and has brought quite a number of leading, American f leading figures to the Academy each year, among them economist Paul Volcker and Joe Stiglitz, as well as uh, technology entrepreneur Eric Schmidt. Turning to tonight's talk, well, it is certainly no overstatement to say we find ourselves in the midst of a mul multiplicity of crises of the utmost urgency. To our east, the kind of war that many had thought impossible in contemporary Europe is being waged, and the horrors, as we saw anew this week in the photographs from Bucha, are staggering. We continue to have a pandemic that we cannot shake, and even our numbers here at the Academy at this particular event have been almost halved in the last 72 hours. As followers of German politics will know, po politicians here are fairly dumbfounded on this challenge and are reversing themselves every day on what, me uh, what measures should be taken. But there are also challenges further off, which might themselves become long-term crises if not addressed early and comprehensively. And the question of whether our ingenuity is going to destroy our jobs through robotics and AI is certainly high on the list of those crises, or potential crises, I should say. Hardly a day goes by in which new achievements in this field are lauded, and we wonder what social impact the new breakthroughs will bring. Well, to deepen our understanding of these issues tonight, we will hear from Benjamin Friedman, the William Joseph Mayer Professor of Political Economy at Harvard, where he has taught for nearly five decades and where he received three of four degrees, including his doctorate. The fourth, I hasten to add, he received at the other original Cambridge, where he was a Marshall Scholar. <clears throat> Benjamin Friedman has written on a breathtaking range of different subjects, uh, including he has written 14, written and edited, I should say, 14 books and more than 150 scholarly articles, focusing on economic policy, on the role of financial markets in shaping how monetary and fiscal policies affect overall uh, economic activity. He writes frequently, I'm glad to say for the rest of us, non-economists, especially in the New York Review of Books. Uh, his first two books of general interest uh, were called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth and Day of Reckoning, The Consequences of American Economic Policy Under Reagan and After. Professor Friedman is an old and good friend of the American Academy. He visited here first as a distinguished visitor in 2009, and he has twice served on our fellow selection committee. And Ben, there may be a thing or two I want to talk to you about afterwards regarding that selection committee. Last year, he, uh, during our extended Zoom period, 
uh, as we refer to the shutdown. He gave an outstanding talk about his most recent book, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, which I can't um, recommend heartily enough. And while all those accomplishments are as remarkable as can be, I am hugely impressed, and I think I said this last time as well, uh, by one uh, other um, accomplishment not listed on your webpage, and that is that together with your wife, Barbara, who I'm glad is also here tonight, uh, you've raised two scholars, both of whom are already tenured at, at Ivy League institutions. I think that's pretty impressive. And I would like a tip or two on that afterwards as well. Well, um, before we get started, let me uh, just briefly talk about the structure of the evening. Uh, after uh, Professor Friedman's lecture, uh, you're all welcome to participate. Those of you who are here, just raise your hands. If you are joining us by Zoom, please uh, don't raise your hand. Uh, type your question in the Q&A uh, part of the Zoom window and uh, not in the chat uh, column, and uh, we will get to as many submitted questions as we can. We apologize in advance if we can't answer them all. Professor Friedman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dan, for that very generous uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here at the Academy again. Uh, I've now been here enough that I uh, regard this as a familiar setting, and I very much appreciate your inviting me. And I also want to take advantage of uh, the opportunity to thank your staff for their uh, warm hospitality. I don't see Jessica sitting in the back of the room, but uh, the, the whole staff has just been extremely kind to Barbara and me during our stay here, and we very much appreciate it. Now, the subject I want to talk about this evening is the challenge and what I mean by the challenge is not just the challenge to our economy. I'm more interested in the challenge to our politics, to our society, and ultimately, as I'll explain at the end, to the moral character of the society, coming from what I see as uh, the radical changes that will be underway in the next generation in the labor market. These challenges are coming from two sources. One you will recognize here, and the other is AI. And I know there are people present who are <clears throat> very adept at knowing the difference between what's a robot and what's a piece of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to steer away from that. My interest in this subject is not as a technology person. When I teach students about this at Harvard, I explain that if they want to know what goes on on the inside of a robot, I know less about that than anybody in the room. That's not my concern. I'm interested in the society and in our uh, politics. Now, I want to start by uh, showing two uh, videos uh, to warn you. The first one takes about three minutes. The second one takes about 15 seconds. The timing is not uh, accidental. And I want to focus on... Uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing, uh, as you may know, is in the United States the leading <clears throat> uh, opportunity for high-income jobs, not high-income Bill Gates style, but still very solid above-median income uh, employment for people who do not have college educations. And this has been true in the United States for well over a hundred years. Uh, I want to look at the way manufacturing was done a hundred years ago, and I want to look at the way in which it's done today, and I've deliberately picked what has always been the flagship piece of manufacturing for our uh, economy, and that is the automobile sector. So let's see if I can get uh, the first video to play, and to repeat, it takes about three minutes. Of all the automobiles that have ever been designed and built in the world, there's one that stands out as most significant above them all, and that's the Model T Ford. That there were women the Model T introduced in the, mass in production factory, and single-handedly brought us from a horse and buggy job. level of we technology of these jobs to one where we had machines that were run by gasoline engines. True. And it isn't Using today. a moving assembly line, <clears throat> Henry Ford was able to build these things in about one-tenth the time it took to build uh, other vehicles by hand previous to the Model T. The Model T's were simple, they were rugged, they were cheap, and as Henry Ford used to say, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. 
when they were first introduced in 1909, they sold for $950, which doesn't sound like much to us today. Back then, that was quite a lot of money. Henry Ford cleverly paid his employees $5 a day, which back then was a huge amount of money compared to other jobs that they could get. He also reduced their work day from nine to eight hours, but again, by doing that, he could have three production shifts working and hence build cars around the clock. All of this was going on at a time of uh, economic difficulty and transition, and so the result of this is people would come from all over the country to get jobs working in Detroit at the auto factories, and of course, their job of choice was with Ford. Production of the Model A's went for 19 years, from 1908 to 1928, and uh, the last ones that were built that weren't very much different from the very first ones that he originally produced. They had wooden spoked wheels with metal rims pressed on them. You can see here what they're doing is hand uh, filing the spokes uh, to make them smooth so they can be painted. The engine was a ridiculously simple, by today's standard and light, 177 cubic inch, which is 2.9 liter, four-cylinder engine, uh, which produced 20 horsepower. The vehicle weighed oh, about 1,200 pounds, depending on which body style you got and would be good for about uh, 40 to 45 mile an hour top speed. And it had two forward gears. The assembly line was split so that the frame and the wheels and tires and everything were assembled at one point, and then the bodies were assembled separately, and then at one point, the body would be dropped onto the frame. Over the years, an enormous number of body styles were created. You had a touring car, a roadster, a roadster pickup a ton truck, a closed cab ton truck, a coupe, a two-door, a four-door, a center door, a station wagon, and a convertible. A uh, pretty versatile vehicle. Eventually, the Model T was replaced by a Model A, which was a modernized, stylized version of a vehicle that looked quite the same. Okay, so that was the core of manufacturing <clears throat> 100 years ago. And so now we're going to look at uh, automobile manufacturing today. We're not going to look at Ford. We're going to look at Tesla. Okay, so here's a Tesla factory. Now, does something strike you as different between <clears throat> the Ford of 100 years ago and the Tesla for today? What is it? Anybody? No people. No people, no, no, no people in, the Tesla, in the Tesla factory. They have some executives and some technicians off on the side, but the, the production uh, process uh, has no people. Now, we have today in the United States about 12 million, and so we're, we're, not ta we're talking pretty good size groups of people, uh, 12 million manufacturing workers. I'll take another one now from the services industry. Let's look at uh, delivery services. This is what we think, think of as delivery uh, today. This is also not as big as manufacturing, but it's not tri trivial either. We have 4 million people working in the uh, delivery industry. Once again, it's a high income, that is to say, above median income <clears throat> job for people who do not have anything more than a high school education. Well, what's uh, the future of the uh, delivery industry? Well, is this what we're going to have, delivering our packages? I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but as I'll explain as we go forward, <clears throat> I think there will be changes even within the delivery industry that will uh, be comparable to what's happening in manufacturing. So that whether we're looking at manufacturing, that's 12 million people, delivery is 4 million people, construction is 7 million people, this starts to add up. And this is the core of where the high-income jobs are for people without, high school, without college educations. Now, here's the challenges I see it. The first one is a familiar one. The issue, which many other people have discussed, is whether the coming generation of citizens, I'm thinking mostly about the United States, but I think these problems are more generic, <clears throat> whether the coming generation of citizens 
will have meaningful work to do. Is, is, are there going to be jobs? My answer is going to be yes, so just to anticipate. But second, then I want to go on to the question of what those jobs will be like, in the first instance in the sense of the wage, but second, the <clears throat> sense that people get of meaningfulness in their work because people derive satisfaction not just from the money that they take home, but from the activities that they participate in on a regular basis. I think that's where we're going to have a challenge. And then, to me, the challenge is not just for the individuals, but collectively for the society. I think uh, the political and the social and ultimately, I would argue, the moral character of the society, using moral self-consciously, in an 18th century sense, the moral character of the society is very much at risk and therefore we have to contemplate very seriously uh, what can we do and what should we do. Now I want to begin with a familiar distinction that economists emphasize but that I think receives much too much attention and I will explain why. The question is whether technology is a substitute for labor in the sense that a job that used to be done by a human is now done by a machine, think the Tesla factory, so that labor is simply no longer needed for some task. Uh, we can think of lots of examples. One is telephone operators. We don't have telephone operators anymore. I'm just barely at the cusp of remembering when you would pick up the receiver and talk to a telephone uh, operator. <clears throat> One that I do remember quite well, however, is uh, elevator operators. Today, except for ornamental purposes in some settings, we don't have elevator operators anymore. So these are pure examples of uh, the technology as a substitute for labor. The alternative is that technology is a complement to labor. Technology makes <clears throat> labor more productive, and because technology makes the labor more productive, we don't necessarily need as much of it. So here's an example. This is not very high-tech. That's a vacuum cleaner. Uh, the janitors who clean up our offices can do more work with a vacuum cleaner than they used to do with a pail and a broom and a mop, and therefore we need fewer of them doesn't have to be very high-tech at all. Here is the example of what I think has been the most destructive uh, piece of <clears throat> labor complementing technology uh, that I know of within the last hundred years. It's the simple tractor. Uh, have, has anybody in the room read the wonderful novel by John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath? Well, if you've read the novel, what you remember is that it's all about these <clears throat> Oklahoma farmers being driven off the land. What is it that drove them off the land? Steinbeck is explicit. It's partly the Dust Bowl experience of the 1930s, but the novel, that's what's remembered in the novel, but the book is very explicit. Also, what's driving these people off the land is that. It's the tractor. Once the tractor was introduced then the need for human labor to guide the horses to pull either the plow or the reaper was much, uh, much reduced. And as I say, this is the outstanding example, the, uh, as Steinbeck uh, portrays with great pathos in the novel, all of these Okies, as they were called, were driven away. Most of them went to Orange County, California, uh, with great hardship. Here's the famous Dorothea Langa. Uh, portrait of the, uh, the migrant uh, mother. So the fact that technology might be a complement to labor rather than a substitute for labor is not necessarily very comforting from this perspective. Either way, it means that there's less demand for human labor. Now, on the other side, which is what makes this an interesting economic uh, situation. On the other side are three economic forces that I want to put on the table because they're very important. Uh, the first one is that as these complementary technologies um, take effect, they make certain activities 
economical that would not have been economical before. Things that people knew how to do, but didn't bother to do because there were more, it was too expensive. An example that I'm guessing everybody in the room knows about is the mutual fund industry. Everybody always knew about the principle of having a fund in which individual share owners of the fund would own their proportionate piece of 50 or 100 or even 500 uh, different stocks or bonds or whatever. But it was too expensive to operate a mutual fund like that. What is it that made the mutual fund economical? It was the computer industry. Once computers came in, then it became possible uh, on an economic basis to have mutual funds. And in the United States, as well as everywhere else in the world, we now have mutual funds. In fact, uh, shockingly, in the United States, we have more mutual funds than we do stocks. Uh, this, is, this, is clear, this is clearly not the efficient way to organize your securities markets, but, uh, but we do. So that's an example of complementary technology making possible an activity that was always there, but just didn't make any sense economically. Second, to the extent that incomes might rise because of <clears throat> the increased productivity and Hidden in that statement is a very important distributional assumption because the fact that the labor becomes more productive doesn't necessarily mean that the wage earners will earn that productivity. But to the extent that they do, <clears throat> then there's more demand even for the same set of goods and services, and therefore uh, more people would be employed. And then third, to the extent that the technology unlike in the mutual fund example, makes possible new goods and new services, well, somebody has to uh, produce those. Here's a look at the composition of what we in the United States spend on as consumers, and starting right after our Civil War, and I'm distinguishing here between categories of consumer goods <clears throat> that actually existed in 1969, and new categories of consumer goods that just didn't exist at all. It's easy to think of examples. Think of uh, air traffic, think of uh, the automobile. They had railroads, but they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have automobiles. Think of television sets, think of radios, think of phonographs, think of films, all of that. By definition, in, 19, in 1869, 100% of the consumption spending was on goods that existed in 1869. Come forward to the most recent time this calculation was done, well over half of what we buy today as consumers is on these items that did not even exist. It's not that they're improved since 1869. They didn't even exist in 1869. And you see this also taking place in the structure of what people do. Here's a chart of the change in what Americans do at work compared to 19, uh, 1940. The blue bars are employment measured by millions in 1940. The combination of the green and the red are employment, basically as of now. But the distinction is that green are people who are doing jobs that existed in 1940, and the red are people doing jobs that uh, didn't even exist in 1940. Well, clearly, one thing that's happened is that we don't have very many farmers or miners anymore, but that's not what this story is about. Look at what's happening here where the big increase in employment is, professionals, man managers, Look at what the professionals are doing. It's not just that there are so many more professionals today than there were before World War II. It's that the great majority of those professionals are doing work that didn't, the job category just didn't even exist in, uh, in 1940. Think of, uh, think of 
uh, con con computer technicians, for example. Even in production, go back to the manufacturing industry example that we had a few minutes ago, close to half, not quite half, of the jobs today in manufacturing production are in lines of work that didn't exist before World War II. So one of the things that's happening with the technology that we have to take into account is that at the same time that it's <clears throat> reducing the need for labor in the old jobs and making the old goods and producing the old services, it's providing new ways of employment. So we have this uh, technological tug of war. Now, why does the balance of these opposing forces matter so much? I want to talk about three elements. One <clears throat> is the one that gets most of the attention, I think, unfortunately. This is about work versus non-work. I think that's the least important part of the problem, and I'll explain why. Second, though, is economic inequality. Everybody is aware, I assume, that inequality throughout the world has been widening. It's even true here in Europe. And I think I want to in talk about the way in which this balance of opposing forces is going to drive uh, economic inequality. And third is the quality of people's jobs, not just the wage, but what they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's start with the employment versus uh, non-work. The idea of technological unemployment is a very old notion uh, in economics. It wasn't always called that, but it's a very old notion. The first example that I came across uh, is not from the English language literature. It's from Jean-Baptiste Say. Uh, Say was a French economist, most famous for his uh, textbook in which he uh, adopted one of the first people to put uh, Adam Smith's uh, ideas into textbook form. And in the book in 1803, uh, Say talked about emergencies, as he's calling them. So he's clearly thinking not about a long-term trend. Emergencies in which hands, the 18th century word for workers, are thrown out of work. And what are we supposed to do about it? He says, we need to encourage new channels of industry. Well, it's really striking the ex to the extent to which in 1803, uh, Mr. Say got it right. I think he, I think he, really, he really had the, he had both the idea and he had the solution, both correct. The first example I know in the economics literature is ex especially interesting. David Ricardo was the most distinguished uh, English economist of the first half of the 19th century, uh, wrote uh, his book on political economy and, taxa and taxation in around 1912. Uh, and in uh, Ricardo's textbook, he uh, dismissed the idea of what we're calling technological unemployment uh, as just wrong. And in the second edition of the book, he likewise dismissed the idea of the book. And then in 1821, uh, in the third edition of the book, he inserted a remarkable chapter titled Machinery, in which he comes right out and he says, in the first two editions of my book, I got it wrong. It's, just, it's quite, quite, quite astonishing admission. And here is what he said, it is the key sentence. He talks about uh, causes which may increase what he calls the net revenue of the country, what we would call making the country richer, or increasing the gross domestic product, may at the same time render the population redundant and deteriorate the condition of the laborer. So he clearly, this is 1821, he clearly has the idea that there could be developments, and he identifies it with machinery, and he goes on to explain in some detail how certain developments could make the society richer in the aggregate but deteriorate the, uh, the uh, standard of living of workers. Come forward a hundred years, and we now get to the first introduction of the phrase technological unemployment, and it's due to Keynes. Keynes was extremely optimistic about productivity growth. He turned out to be right. Uh, 
He thought productivity growth over the coming hundred years would increase by somewhere, the productivity would increase by somewhere between a factor of four and a factor of eight. We're coming very close to the end of his hundred years, and it looks as if the top end is going to be right. We're going to be right on the eight to one uh, increase in productivity. And then what does he think is going to happen? We're going to have what he calls a new disease that people may not have heard of called technological unemployment. Those are not my italics. Those are Keynes's uh, italics. And this is the first introduction of the phrase in uh, economics literature that I know of. Well, why do I not think this is a problem? I think it's because, by and large, at least in the United States, the labor, depart the labor market <clears throat> is going to clear. Here's the standard conceptual framework that economists use. I've plotted the number of workers on the horizontal axis, the wage they receive on the vertical axis, demand for labor by employers slopes downward, supply of labor by the workers slopes upward, market is in equilibrium with this number of workers earning that wage. If it turns out that the balance of forces that we're focusing on reduces the uh, demand for labor, then the labor demand curve shifts back. At that point, there's a new equilibrium. And some people at the new lower wage, the wage, wage has gone down, but at the new lower wage, there are indeed fewer people at work. So there's a non-work problem, but they're not unemployed. Now, we might try as a policy matter to resist the decline in the wage. We would do that, for example, by imposing a minimum wage, which tries to preserve the wage almost at the level where it was before. And if we do that, then at that minimum wage, there will be more people who want to work than there are demand for. And at that point, yes, then we have unemployment, but it's not a technological unemployment. That's, that's minimum wage unemployment. And as people may be aware in the United States, there's currently a movement to raise our minimum wage from the current $7 level up to uh, either 15 or in some places uh, $20. And it will be very interesting to see whether we get any serious unemployment uh, as a result. We simply don't know. There is no evidence that would enable us to make that judgment. This is one of these many examples <clears throat> in which our fragmented system of political decision making in the United States, which is often a drawback for us, turns out to be a great advantage. We don't have to have the debate over the $15 minimum wage at the national level. We're having it at the state level. We're having it at the individual city level. And so as we go forward, we're going to find out what the effect is. But leaving aside the minimum wage problem, the labor market will clear. There will be fewer workers employed and they will be earning a lower wage, but I don't think there will be widespread unemployment as a result of this. Let's then talk about the other two issues. First, economic inequality. I assume everybody is aware that just about everywhere uh, economic inequality has uh, increased. This is one measure. This is the share of total income that accrues to people in the top 10% of the income distribution, but the picture would look pretty much the same no matter which measure of inequality I picked. In some countries like uh, the U.S., that's the blue line, the increase in an inequality has been large and unremitting. In India, it's been much more dramatic. China has been uh, pretty dramatic as well. Europe has had less increase in inequality than we have, but it's worth, uh, it's worth being clear. Any, any time a European says that Europe is free of the increase in inequality, you tell them that's wrong. It, just, it, 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 is, it is not correct. It's correct that the Europeans have had less increase than we have, but they haven't had zero. Here is, uh, incidentally, what the U.S. Uh, income distribution uh, looks like and how it's changed between 1989 and, 19, uh, and 2016, and you'll notice that what's happened is that it's become more unequal. The, 
a uh, number of people right in the middle of the distribution uh, has fallen. The red line is below the, b the blue, and where have those people gone? They've gone out into the tails of the distribution. The distribution has become much more spread out. To give you some numbers, this is <clears throat> in logarithms, and so <clears throat> the uh, 11 is the log of about 60,000, so the mean is about 60,000, but it's not symmetrical on either side. Uh, 10 would be the log of about 22,000, whereas 12 would be the log of about 160,000. If you give it down to nine, that's corresponding to about $8,000. If you got up to 13, that's uh, about uh, $450,000. 450 is about the uh, entry point for entry into the famous top 1%. Turns out you don't have to make that much money to be in the top 1%, 450,000. So think two doctors, two lawyers, two professors, two whatever. Uh, you're, you're, you're right away in the top 1%. So we have widening inequality, and especially in Europe where people have been very influenced by Thomas Piketty's very useful work, people sometimes think that the widening of inequality is mostly about the role of wealth holding, which is extremely unequal. It isn't. The main part of the increase in inequality is the widening inequality within wage income. And so here you see it for men in the United States. The, this is what's happening. This is the strong increase in people in the top 10th percentile. This is the, the 10th percentile, 10 from the top. The red is people in the Median, right at the 50th percentile, and notice that for the last half century, after adjusting for inflation, these people at the median have had virtually no increase in their wage. And for the people in the bottom, this is the 90th percentile, they're actually earning less today than they were back in the early 70s. The situation is not quite so severe. This is the same thing for women, 10th percentile, 50th and 90th. So we have very sharply widening inequality even within uh, wage uh, income. Now, where is this coming from? It's coming from this change in the occupational structure that we were looking at a minute before, ago for the United States. Here we have it for, what is it, 16 EU countries. And what we see is that in every, this is dividing up the change in employment over nearly a two-decade period between low-paying occupations, middle, and high-paying. In every one of these European countries, there has been a shrinkage in middle-income occupations. In every one except two, namely Luxembourg and Finland, this has been balanced in part by an increase in low-paying occupations, and in every one of the 16, part of the balancing is by high-paying. So we have this bifurcation of the labor market. It's a hollowing out of the middle of the income distribution, not just at random, it's a hollowing out because those jobs that pay middle income uh, wages are disappearing and being replaced by either low income jobs or high income jobs. Germany has had less of this than other countries, but even in Germany we see a, a hollowing out of the middle and I'm guessing that it will continue on. So the phenomenon that we're talking about is very much a driver of this widening inequality that of course has very severe uh, political and social implications in most of our countries. Let me now talk about the quality of uh, people's jobs. To repeat, people get satisfaction from their jobs, not be just because they take home money, but because they get to feel pleased with themselves for what they are doing uh, on the job on a day-to-day -day basis. The awkward phrase that I have been using to describe this problem is de-skilling. <clears throat> I would be very grateful if anybody in this group 
<clears throat> could suggest a better phrase for me. So take, take in, the, in, the, in the spirit of leaving, a, uh, leaving an unproved theorem on a colleague's desk, take, take that as an assignment, if you will, if you could come up with a, <clears throat> a better phrase. What do, I, <clears throat> what do I have in mind? As I mentioned before, we have about 4 million people in the United States doing delivery services. Uh, think the FedEx truck, think the UPS truck. These are very stable, high-income jobs for uh, people who do not have uh, college educations. Now, I know people who think that uh, within finite time, these will be replaced either by the drone we were looking at before or by the trucks will be speeding around our streets with no people in them. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that even 20 years from now, these, these trucks will have people in them. But ask yourself, what will the person in the truck be doing? He or she won't be plotting the route from one uh, drop-off point to the next. That's being done already by computer in the same way that your Uber driver doesn't plot the route. When you take an Uber, you can see the... Uh, the route being uh, shown to the driver right there up on the dashboard. So the driver isn't going to be plotting the route. The driver isn't going to be deciding uh, what, uh, what's the ordering of the destinations. I don't think the driver is really going to even be driving the car most of the time. I think what the driver is going to be doing is picking up the package and running it up to your doorstep and coming back into the car and the truck, and as the truck speeds off into the next destination, the person will take out the touch screen, which they already have, and push the picture icon to indicate that the package was left at your doorstep, or if you live in an apartment building, the different icon to indicate that is left in your delivery room. Well, think a minute about the difference between the skill requirement for that job and the skill requirement that in recent years we've known for uh, UPS drivers. This is degrading, de-skilling the job to the level of the checkout guy at the McDonald's. The checkout guy at the McDonald's doesn't need to know anything. All he has to do is push the picture icon saying you bought the cheeseburger and the machine does the rest. And so you know two things, I think. One is that as the job gets de-skilled so that the skill requirement for driving a UPS truck is comparable to the skill requirement for a McDonald's checkout person, the <coughs> wage at UPS will devolve down onto uh, McDonald's wages. And the second thing you know is that people will have the same attitude toward the job that the McDonald's uh, people do. These people will not go away thinking that they're uh, doing something meaningful and rewarding and remunerative. Now, uh, another Cambridge economist, I think, got this one right. Instead of Tech Keynes's technological un unemployment, I think what we're going to have is what James Mead thought of as he called it a super world of an immiserized proletariat, and being English, he looked back at butlers, footmen, kitchen maids, and other hangers-on. This was Mead writing in 1965. Uh, and so uh, I think that is much more likely to be the problem than the technological unemployment problem. Now, what do we do? I can identify three strategies, and there may well be more, and I'd be glad to hear other ideas because I don't think any of my strategies is uh, particularly uh, um, going to solve the whole problem. The first is simply to re accept this combination of somewhat reduced labor force participation and the lower wages and make provision uh, as best we can for those people who don't uh, have jobs or whose wages are too low. Uh, this is going to create, in the first instance, a great need for redistribution. You here in Europe are much better at that than we are in the United States. 
we are going to have a lot of trouble with uh, that level of redistribution if we need to do it. Uh, there have been ideas like uh, universal basic income. They just haven't caught on. Andrew Yang did not get elected president of the United States on that program. This is not going anywhere. And then second, I think especially for the people who either don't have jobs or um, have extremely low incomes, I think there's going to be a very severe psychological burden which is going to uh, increase greatly our uh, difficulties that we are already having. Uh, it comes as no surprise that the attitude toward life of people who are employed versus unemployed is sharply different. People who are employed have a higher life evaluation, more positive affect and lower uh, negative uh, and, uh, lower negative affect. Transitions are very, very difficult. Uh, here's both for men and women. Now this is in the United States. This shows what happens when people get unemployed. This is the erosion of what the psychologists call SWB, subjective well-being. Even four years after the loss of a job, for men, there is no indication of said subjective well-being coming back upward. For women, there's no indication up to the third year, and who knows whether that fourth year tick up uh, is, uh, is, is for real. In the United States, we also have a very severe problem now of what we call deaths of despair, basically voluntary deaths, some combination of suicide, drugs, and alcohol. We're up to about 200,000 of those a year. These are the cohort experiences. So this is the cohort of people born in 1980. And you can see the rise in <clears throat> uh, uh, deaths of despair per 100,000. And you can see how before World War II, there was basically no changes. But starting in the post-war period, every five-year cohort has shifted further and further and further over so that the deaths of despair problem has become more and more severe. I'm not pretending that the deaths of despair is exclusively because of labor market issues, but everybody who's looked at this concludes that labor market issues are a big uh, part of the story. Now, why is this? I think it's very easy to understand. This is quite central to Western thinking going all the way back. And when I say all the way back, here we are, the, uh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the first chapter of the... The uh, Bible is about the creation, and uh, then we move on in chapter 2 <clears throat> to the view of uh, what has happened, and it's quite, uh, quite dramatic that the word work appears three times <laughs> in succession. They didn't have to do that. But three times they, described, they, they referred to the act of creation uh, as work, and moreover, what doesn't come through in the English is that the word that's being translated as work uh, is the word for free labor. There's a different word for, for slave labor and for free labor, and the word that's being tra the oops did I the word the word that's being translated in each of these cases is free labor. So the idea is the association goes way back of free labor with with creativity. Uh, coming forward, especially for Americans with our Puritan-based culture. Uh, here is the arch of all arch Puritans, Cotton Mather. And look what he says about work. He says everybody should have a calling. Uh, Mather refers to every Christian, but he lived in a, he lived in a place where non-Christians weren't allowed to live anyway. So he, he does, he's in distinguishing between those and others. So... Uh, he says everybody should have a calling. It isn't honest that you don't have a calling. You should, your business should engross most of your time <clears throat> to be without a calling. 
uh, is a violation of the Eighth uh, Commandment. We always think about the Eighth Commandment as about stealing. He thinks of it as about having, uh, having uh, a business. But it isn't just uh, in the religious sphere. Here's Franklin Roosevelt, very first address to the American people on being inaugurated as president at the very bottom of the Great Depression. He could have said, our assignment is to get people back to work so that they can earn an income. That would have been a very sensible thing to say at the bottom of the Great Depression. That isn't what Roosevelt chose to say. He says, uh, happiness lies in the joy of achievement in creative effort. Well, he could have been quoting from uh, the Bible, but he was. He talks about the joy and moral stimulation of work. He says, that's why they wanted to put people back to work. So all of this... The, it's it, coming especially in Western culture and especially for Americans. It's very easy to see why enforced idleness will be uh, a, a major problem. Here's Keynes again in the same essay in which he coined his phrase on technological unemployment. Keynes thinks this is going to be a great uh, deal of di great difficulty to change people's attitudes. He thinks that these habits and instincts. <clears throat> that have been bred into us for centuries. By going back to the Hebrew Bible, we're showing it's not just centuries, it's millennia, are going to be very, very hard to uh, get rid of. So Keynes thought we were going to have this problem of attitudes where people think that the moral thing to do is work and become unhappy uh, when they aren't giving me get given meaningful work to do is done. Well, if we're not just going to live with the strategy of accepting the reduced participation in the lower incomes, what do we do? I have two other strategies to offer. One is to use conventional labor supply and labor demand policies to try to address the problem. Uh, the most obvious one is to use education to make our uh, labor supply more adaptable. Here again is this demonstration that the nature of work changes and if you were educating people to fill the jobs in the blue bars, you absolutely were not training them for the jobs in the red bars that became much more prevalent. And we see this in the labor force. Uh, this is the participation rate in the labor force of men in the prime working age uh, uh, ages. And it's been gradually coming down, but notice it has been coming down much more steeply for people who are not educated uh, well. And notice that only about what looks like about 83% of high school educated males of prime age in the United States are now at work. Well, what are the other uh, what are what are the other seventeen percent doing? Those are the prime candidates for the deaths of despair. You see it in inequality as well. Here are the wages now uh, distinguished by the amount of education that people uh, have. Either high school graduates, that's the yellow, or the high school dropouts. And even people with some, but not a complete college education, after adjustment for inflation, are earning less today, if they're men, than they were 50 years ago. That's really shocking, or than their grandparents were earning 50 years ago. And at the same time, college graduates are doing decently, and people with graduate degrees are doing, uh, doing uh, splendidly. Uh, Dan, you were asking about how to motivate uh, young people. When, when I give talks at various colleges around the United States, and I, especially at colleges where people, uh, unlike my university, where young people have a tendency to want to, gradu to want to drop out before they graduate, what I tell them is the choice you're making is whether you want to be this gray line or the blue or the, or or one of the blue lines. That's, that is what you're deciding, and it's it's quite true. Women have had a slightly uh, more compressed experience, but it's still very unequal. So what would we do? 
The problem is that we don't know. The problem is really twofold. We don't know what kind of education would be best. And here I think the Germans may have a great deal of uh, lesson to teach us. Uh, Germany has a very different educational system than we do, especially for people who are not going on to universities. And I think it well behooves us to learn from the German experience. One of the daunting factors is the question, uh, which nobody knows an answer to, of whether social skills can be taught. There's an increasing amount of uh, evidence, I think of my Harvard colleague Dave Deming, I think of Jim Heckman at Chicago, I think of other people, uh, demonstrating that social skills are becoming increasingly important <coughs> for people's labor market experience. People who rank high by social skills are more likely to graduate from high school, more likely to go on to college, more likely to have stable job market attachment after they graduate from whatever they're going to graduate from. That's all clear. The question is then is what do you do about it? Can we teach social skills? We don't know. The, the answer is we don't know. What other kind of uh, strategy can we do? Pursue one other one that appeals to me is research. Uh, we talked earlier about the development of new products, new goods, new services. And uh, clearly research is essential to that. The outstanding example uh, here again is the talk about the importance of uh, new goods and new services. The ex outstanding example that I have in mind is the wartime military uh, research. And within that category, the outstanding example is this instrument. This is the uh, first transistor. Uh, developed by Bob Bardeen during the World War II uh, on contract from the U.S. Navy. And, of course, as we all know, what started out looking like that now looks like this. There's a whole electronics industry. Where did that come from? came from the Navy sponsoring Bardeen's uh, research that gave us the transistor. So I think there's, uh, th there's room to do more in that front. The third strategy that I would like to see us emphasize, especially in light of what's going on in our society today, is to look to public employment in a way that, at least in the United States, we have not for uh, two generations, to create jobs, to not just create jobs at random, but to fill specific public needs. What do I have in mind? Well. We're focused on the environment and climate. Uh, we're going to need uh, alternative energy equipment. Somebody's got to manufacture those sol solar cells. Somebody's got to climb up on your roof and install it. I think these jobs need to be uh, created in part uh, by government, uh, education, staffing in the public schools. Uh, our uh, Population is not aging as rapidly as yours here in Germany, but we're, we too have a very rapidly expanding retired elderly population. They need, need to be care, cared for. I've mentioned research. We need to have staffing in labs, other facilities. What each of these pursuits has in common is some very strong element of a public externality. It's not just making hamburgers to sell to somebody. There's a public externality, a public purpose to it. And this takes me back to the thinking of my uh, late colleague and much uh, Miss dear friend Ken Galbraith. Two-thirds of a century ago, uh, Ken argued that our failure to keep up our public services, at least in some, he called it, minimal relation to our standard of living, he thought was a cause of social disorder. I think time has proved him right. And his solution is that we need to find a way to remedy what he called the poverty of our public services, which is in such contrast with the affluence of our uh, provision of private goods and services. Now, Ken was writing this in the com completely in the absence of the uh, public good aspect that I'm emphasizing having to do with environment and so forth. And so if you take that public externality element and add it to 
the argument that he was making, I think it becomes uh, quite compelling. Oops, what's that? So I think these, these are all wor at, worth pursuing. I'd like to close by taking just a couple of minutes to address what I think is the risk of not acting, because I think there really is a major risk of not acting. Uh, one of the principal findings of a part of my own research is that whether a society experiences sustained improvements in living standards broadly spread across the population or not makes an enormous difference in the political, social, and to repeat the uh, moral character of the society. When people are experiencing sustained increases in their material living standards and they have some reason for confidence that that increase will continue, that's the circumstance in which societies make improvements in these other non-material aspects of their lives. And conversely, when people experience stagnation or worse in their material living standards, not only is there not any improvement, but often there are reversals and often quite disastrously so. And what does some of this look like? Well, here are some of the consequences uh, whenever living standards stagnate. And it's clear that at least in the United States, but I would argue elsewhere, uh, we are experiencing exactly these today, increasing reluctance to make economic uh, opportunities available in the society, growing intolerance. The most obvious one in all of our countries is intoler antipathy toward immigrants, but as an American, I of course think about race uh, relations, diminished de generosity to uh, the poor, and even, uh, as we've seen so dramatically recently in the U.S., an erosion of commitment to democratic institutions. These are not just accidents. These are the predictable pathologies that ensue whenever a society experiences sustained stagnation in living standards for the broad bulk of the population. And I think that's what we've got uh, today in my country. The red line here is the increase uh, in um, per capita GDP, and there's basically been no uh, slowdown in that. But starting around 1980, the blue line, which is the income of the median American family, the family right in the middle of the income distribution, started not to keep up. It kept up just fine until about 1980 and then departed. And I think much of the pathology that we see today has to do with this period of about 20 years in which the family in the middle of the income distribution had absolutely no increase in its standard of living. This compares with other periods of stagnation in the past. So we have this risk, I think, if we don't act of a kind of vicious circle in which economic stagnation, coming in part, not only, but coming in part from these technological trends, will create political and social rigidities, and the political and social rigidities in turn will make it impossible to deal with the economic stagnation. And alas, we've seen this before, and usually the root out is not uh, pretty. So I would argue that we have a fairly urgent need to confront the problem that we face. And I would say that in light of our other urgent public needs, things like climate, things like uh, uh, caring for the elderly population, we should treat these, this technological threat as not just a threat, but an opportunity to uh, address in a public way these externalities that are there and are currently not addressed. So the, the need is urgent. I think we have some things that we know of that we can do, but we need to find more. Dan, why don't I stop and we'll let other people get in the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm trying to mimic your 
optimism because you have a way of, de of delivering really bad news in a cheerful sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they always called it the dismal science, but, you know, you have a way of, of making us want to do something good about it, and I, I think that's I quite... I reject the dismal science. I mean, it's under, dismal science was a phrase coined by Carlyle in the middle of the 19th century, 19th century, and you could easily see why coming off of uh, this period in which uh, the thinking was shaped by people like Malthus and Mill and Marx, you could understand why uh, Carlyle thought that way. But I think that's a mischaracterization. One should go back to Smith. Economics was and still is uh, a product of the Enlightenment, and it uh, shares the fundamental optimism about the human enterprise, which was at the core of Enlightenment thinking. And so if, if Carlyle had known Smith and Hume instead of Mill and Marx, he would have done a lot better. <laughs> well, you know, I think the other part of the story there is that Carlyle was projecting because he, he was himself a rather depressive type. Uh, and, I uh, didn't know this. Oh, yes. Well, um, one of my all-time favorite uh, lines comes from uh, one of his biographers who uh, once said there must have been a beneficent God because he married Carlyle to Mrs. Carlyle, thereby making two people unhappy instead of four. <laughs> so <coughs> there's some things you don't forget. Um, <coughs> so I am uh, going to um, prime the pump here, to use a good economic phrase, uh, with a question or two of my own. And the first question I want to ask is, you treated in, in, this, um, in, in this discussion, admittedly for us laymen, uh, robotics and AI as being uh, essentially um, uh, causes of this um, long-term development of, of the same nature. And from what I read, uh, which is haphazard, I get the sense that AI is a different, uh, potentially a different kind of problem. For one thing, there's a lot of talk about AI um, eliminating jobs from the upper reaches of Correct. the economy. Um, David Kennedy and I were uh, meeting with a, a distinguished law firm this morning, and I was looking around. And I wanted to ask them how they felt about all the projections about the elimination of legal jobs because of AI. I was in uh, Frankfurt recently talking to uh, some uh, investors, and, and they believe that AI is going to actually eliminate a lot of medical jobs because of, uh, and high-end medical jobs because uh, AI will deliver better differential diagnoses of a lot of um, maladies. That, that's one part of it. And the other part of it is that AI may enable people, and I don't know a lot about AI, but it may enable a lot of those new products to be made, but it will also make the next jump to making them without people. And so uh, I wonder if you want to answer that part of the, um, shall we say, global nervousness. Well, I think you're certainly right. First place, uh, looking, uh, I don't, I don't see David. Did, oh, there, there, there he is. Well, apologies, David. I can't get worked up about the problem of not having enough lawyers. This is just not, not, not going to keep me, uh, keep me up at night. I think it is true that some of the higher income uh, jobs will be uh, eroded but not to anywhere near the extent of the bottom. And I think at the same time, it's easy to see higher income jobs being created. So I think uh, there are lots of ways in which, uh, you know, think of the Tesla factory, somebody has to be designing those robots. Somebody has to be uh, looking after them. So I think there are, uh, with some transitions, I think the high-end folks will take care of themselves. My, my crude division is that there will be about a third of the labor force who will be moved into uh, higher productivity, more interesting, more productive, more remunerative jobs, and about two-thirds in the other direction. 
Uh, on the medical side, I think it's quite clear that what works is not, um, not machine reading of x-rays alone, but machine reading of x-rays together with humans. I know of no good hospitals that do it only with, uh, only, only with the, the machines. So I, th I, th I, 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 I can see some issues, but I think these are not of the fundamental social character that we're talking about. And, and you think that um, the threat, I, I would say it's a double threat to manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm because AI both makes the improvement and then makes the improvement humanless. Uh, if, at least that's the theory of the case. Again, we're in the early days of AI, so I don't really know. I guess now, now, now we're getting into this issue that, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not the right person to talk to about. And that, that, that's this division of what's, what's a robot and what's the AI. Again, think of the Tesla factory. Was that AI at work, or were those things we saw robots? Well, the answer is there's... Uh, there's machine learning and there's programming behind it and exactly where you draw the line, I don't have a view. You know, it's good you didn't show the Tesla film to um, a lot of uh, officials in this area because the biggest new economic development is a huge Tesla factory on the outskirts of Berlin. Well, they thought be, it was going to create a huge amount of jobs. Well, it will be very interesting <laughs> to come back and see whether... Uh, see whether it, it yeah. creates jobs. I remember some years ago, I first became alert to this problem in which uh, when I was giving a talk, I think it was in Cincinnati, which has always been a manufacturing center, center in the United States, and I was giving a talk to a bunch of businessmen and they were all talking about how the economy there was reviving. I guess this must have been a few years after the financial crisis of 2008, 9, 10. And they were all talking about all their new investments and the increase in production. And then I asked about uh, increased uh, employment roles. And they all had the same answer. They said, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. It is all, this is all about production. It's not about, uh, not about workers. So it'll be very interesting to see if the local Tesla people actually employ humans. Another question. Your, <clears throat> your talk is... Um it is depressing to those of us who've watched the decay of uh, democratic institutions in the United States, and which I think has, to a large extent, focused a lot of people's attention on the anti-statist tradition in the U.S. And the more that their things have decayed, the harder it is to imagine people getting behind the kind of public policies uh, that you are endorsing, in part because in America it's all about who's going to benefit from this, and there will be fingers pointed in both directions across racial, ethnic, geographic uh, lines. And it seems to uh, require a farsightedness and an embrace of the state that is just really hard to conjure. No. I agree with you. I think we are in the midst of this kind of vicious cycle that I described in which people's attitudes are not wholly but in part being shaped by the economic stagnation. And a consequence of that economic stagnation is that people are less willing to support the kind of actions that uh, would potentially turn things around. People are less willing to support action. Why? In part because exactly as you say, they're worrying, you know, is somebody else going to benefit from this more than I am? When economies are growing and people are moving forward in their living standards, people don't get exercised about those issues. They say, well, I'm moving forward, and if somebody else happens to uh, move forward a little faster than I am, that's okay as long as I'm moving forward. People are very self-centered in their uh, attitudes, and as soon as their own material progress changes, then their attitudes toward all sorts of things change. Well, I have more <laughs> questions, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. Yes, right here. Uh, well, I would like to hear your um, opinion on some recent trends we are seeing, especially in the labor market in uh, the United States. Uh, where we are speaking about this great resignation and the reasons for that. So um, maybe there are two trends you didn't uh, speak about. 
like uh, negative demographics and um, the other one probably also kind of uh, deglobalization that brings labor back to um, probably to the West. So um, how do you see these two big um, trends or questions? Well, on, on the great resignation, <clears throat> I think it is possible that the inequality has just gotten too great. And then what's going to correct it, what's going to correct it uh, could be the reduced willingness of people to work at those lower uh, end wages. You don't, you don't see the lawyers and the doctors quitting their jobs. You see people in quite low wage uh, occupations. Now, the question, uh, which I haven't understood yet, and I'm not sure anybody does, is what are these people doing to, for a living who resigned? Are they going to be out of work uh, permanently? Are they going to be living off of something else? Uh, it's very difficult to do that indefinitely uh, on our limited welfare system in the U.S. So I think uh, it is entirely possible, if you think of that uh, chart that I showed showing the increase in the college-educated uh, wages and the um, actual decline after inflation in high school dropouts and uh, high school educated people, it's entirely possible that people have gotten to the point of saying, well, I just don't, I, I don't, want, I don't want to work for that anymore. And then the question is, who are they? Are they older people who are retiring uh, early? The first age at which people can draw Social Security benefits is 62, I think. Uh, so is that what's going on? Or is it uh, people who are 30? If they're 30, what are they going to do? I don't, I don't. I don't think we know. Now, the trends you mention are there, uh, and we're going to find out. I think it'll be very interesting two, three years from now to see whether uh, these people have uh, remained out of work or gone back uh, into, the into the labor force. Hard, hard to say. If enough people, uh, uh, if enough people drop out, uh, then uh, get some wage compression as firms find that in order to uh, hire people to take the jobs, you, you need to pay more wages. This would not be all bad if it were true. Professor Kennedy. Um, yeah, so I, I wonder if you could speak to the, the issue of structuring the labor market as one of the possible solutions. So the other thing people sometimes talk about is doing something in the way that labor is structured so that the remuneration to labor is higher. So obviously unionization or social norms that have jobs which only men can do so that the competition for those jobs is lower or only women can do, stuff like that. So that there's, there would be regulatory approaches other than the minimum wage um, that might change the, the relative power of labor in its, in its negotiations with um, employers. Is that real or is that, is that yesterday's um, solution to tomorrow's problem? Uh, my reading of it is that if we were to return to uh, um, a more uh, viable labor union movement in the United States that probably would address some elements of the inequality. But remember, the labor unions uh, never really uh, represented the very low income. Now, increasingly they do now that they're public sector unions. but. For, for those who are here who don't know, one, one of the more interesting economic phenomena in my lifetime, uh, my working lifetime, has been the disappearance of labor unions from the private sector of the American economy. When I began as an economist years ago, 30-odd percent of private sector workers in the United States belonged to some labor union or other uh, today it's now down to 7%, and moreover, it's continuing <clears throat> to fall all the time. There was a time in which whoever was ahead of our main labor federation, the AFL's CIO, was an absolute household name and would be meeting uh, with the president all the time and would be on the front page of the newspapers. For many years, it was a man named George Meany, and then he retired, and he was succeeded by his right-hand person, uh, Lane Kirkland. I don't think I could tell you the name of the person 
who is today the head of the... David, you probably could. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't either. So I do not know the name of the person who currently heads the AFL-CIO. I think it's a, wo I think it's a woman. Do you know, Dan? Well, it, until recently, wasn't it Rich Trumka? Uh, he, he's, and then he died, and now I don't know who. But, but, but you know, but, you get a two-year grace period on a question yeah. like this. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't. But the whole point is, this is not somebody that you see. Now, as to these structural things, uh, as you no doubt know, economists always think that fewer restrictions are uh, better than um, better than uh, more. And so instead of having certain jobs that are reserved uh, for men, my uh, approach would be have, have fewer, have, have more jobs that are op open to anybody because uh, historically those things have led uh, to very perverse outcomes, especially in the United States where we had a uh, large racial component of this. There were all sorts of jobs that uh, were not open to blacks. So I, I would not want to think of that as part of the as, as part of the solution so I'm going to ask uh, one question from uh, our zoom audience <clears throat> thank you for your impressive analysis your discussion of the sources of inequality especially in the US uh, does not center on trade and you are in good company with most economists I suspect it's an economist who wrote this <laughs> the decline in public services technology and other factors account for most of the growing inequality in your view. How and why have populist movements of right and left persuaded voters that trade is the main culprit? And how do you change that? Well, I think the attitude, uh, uh, I didn't really go into the sources of the inequality except that I was talking about technology here because that's the topic of the evening. Right. I am, you know, I guess I should address the person behind yes. the address the person behind the camera. I'm more sympathetic to the role of trade, and I think attitudes are changing. My, uh, my reading of this is that if you asked economists to rank the leading uh, sources of the widening inequality over the last half a century, uh, what they would probably do, put in first place, is the gap in so many countries between the demands of the technology and what's being supplied by the education system, and we have that worse in the United States, but it's true elsewhere as well. And then I'm guessing most economists would talk about, uh, they, wouldn't, they might not uh, explicitly put it in terms of trade. I think the way they would put it would be that within the past uh, 30 years, we've had the entry of roughly a billion and a half new workers into the world, the effective world labor force coming largely from China and India. But thinking about it, that has to be about trade because if we didn't trade with China <coughs> and India, then what difference would it make how many Chinese workers and how many uh, Indian workers were in the export sector? So I think attitudes are changing and my guess is most economists would put trade as number two. I would. The fault that I at first thought you were going to point to is that many people make the mistake of looking at explanations for the widening inequality that are idiosyncratic to the United States, like, for example, the decline of labor unions that Professor Kennedy was just uh, mentioning. And I think that's a mistake, not because these factors aren't playing some role, but here we have this worldwide phenomenon in which everywhere, even in Europe, economic inequality is widening. And therefore, to look to explanations that are unique to the United States just can't get you very far. So we have to look at globally relevant explanations and in that category, I would rate the entry of all of these new people into the labor force, translate in your terms trade, I would put that as number two. So I'm, I'm more sympathetic. Okay, we have three questions over here. This gentleman first, this gentleman second, this gentleman third. Um, I will pick up um, the same question. Uh, <coughs> 
because you started with the technological development and the impressing uh, middle part of your presentation was about inequality. So I'm interested in the question, uh, what are other uh, reasons and other causes for inequality? How do you see the whole landscape? Because uh, neoliberal, neoliberal politics is not technology in a narrow sin yeah. sense. And um, tax politics, for example, uh, aren't uh, technological problems. Uh, you need a lot of taxes uh, to get a public sector to get uh, the uh, tasks done you proposed. Well, I would. I'll just. I'll just list some for you. And now here, I'm going to make the error I was just talking about. I'm going to list some that are U.S. centric. So again, I would start with the technological requirements being placed on the labor force versus what the supply of labor can hold, can, can meet. Uh, second, I would put the uh, entry of all of these uh, new workers into the labor force. Third is a technological fact, uh, development as well, and it's the rise of what you could either call the winner-take-all economy or the superstar economy is a different word for it. Because of technology, increasingly the few firms or the few individuals who are at the very top of whatever is the competition are amassing a share of the total reward pool that's wildly out of the range of prior experience. So look, for example, at top athletes. Look at top uh, entertainers. Um, many of them, you know, typically when people on the left talk about billionaires, they're thinking of Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett and so forth. Uh, there are just as many billionaires who are singers or soccer players or basketball players or whatever. Why is this happening? It's, it's, it's technological, but in a different sense than we were talking. It's technological because everybody can watch the Chicago Bulls on TV. Everybody can watch the Boston Red Sox play on TV. Everybody can watch the World Cup. And it's different from an earlier era in which if people wanted to uh, watch uh, professional sports, uh, they would go to whatever is the local team and watch it play, or if they wanted to uh, listen to music, they would go to the local concert. Now people don't do that. We have telecommunications, so uh, there's that. There's an aspect of it in which there's a first mover advantage. Uh, if you're the first mover, lo look at these firms that are at the absolute top of the uh, pecking order today, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and so forth. These are firms who all have uh, what economists call a first mover advantage. And once they achieve market dominance, they are then able to exploit that to extract what we call rents. And these rents in part flow to the workers, part they flow to the share owners, part they flow to the managers. I think all these things are true. Now, we have in the United States some particular issues. One uh, is the uh, erosion of the uh, the labor market. We also the, the labor unions. We also have, I think, uh, uh, an erosion of corporate governance uh, in the United States. I'm guessing that if we had a required statement on the proxy statement of each company uh, asking for share owners' approval of the management compensation, I'm guessing that in many firms that would fail. Uh, we had a movement, it, this is quite interesting in terms of so-called corporate democracy. Some years ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission brought in a proposal to allow share owners to vote on the compensation being paid to the top executives of the firm. Uh, it is astonishing how vigorously the corporate business sector opposed this uh, proposal. And in eventually what passed was a non-binding uh, resolution. But I think there are many companies in which if this were binding it would fail. So I think we have problems in our uh, 
uh, corporate uh, governance uh, sector. And we have other idiosyncratic problems as well, uh, one of which you mentioned is the tax sector. I think the tax uh, actions of the 1980s, then <clears throat> followed by the actions of uh, 2001 and 2003, and then the Trump tax uh, cut, uh, all have been very inimical to the after-tax income distribution. What I was looking at before was the before-tax income distribution, but the after-tax income distribution has been even more hit by these uh, various tax changes taking place over the last 40 years. But to repeat, I think it's an error for people in the U.S., as many do, to place too much emphasis on the explanations that are idiosyncratic to the U.S. But there is no lack of explanations for the widening inequality. It's easy to write down a list of a dozen. The trick is not coming up with the list. The trick is knowing which are the dominant explanations and therefore where the energy of public policy should be focused. And I'm clear in my thinking that number one on the list should be the technology versus the, uh, the education, and number two should be the entry of all of these Chinese and Indians into the labor force, the world labor force. So we are um, actually at the uh, end of our time, but I want to get both of these <coughs> questions in, so if you could make them really quick, we'll collect them both. And, and, I, and, I, and I'll try to be and brief you as can well. Add, so that I can get another question in. No, go ahead. Thank you for the stimulating uh, talk, and f uh, forgive the presumption of someone being stimulated uh, and posing something to someone who's thought a lot harder about this. Um, I was wondering on what's going on, to the extent to which the control on the shop floor. I'm I sorry, the control? Control of workers on the shop floor. I oh. remember um, as a student working in a factory, Mr. Kellogg was the shop superintendent looking around. And now when you hear the stories of Amazon employees, just how carefully monitored they are. And the idea that I have here is uh, it used to be the way you handled the information problem was through what was called an efficiency wage. You had Henry Ford paying the five bucks an hour. That <clears throat> job was so valuable that even though the monitoring was imperfect, you did everything to keep that job because it paid so well. And as we watch the monitoring improving, we see uh, 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 the efficiency wage not being paid. And could that be part of uh, uh, the interaction between the, inequal the hollowing out of the middle um, and the uh, technological changes that we're seeing in the information area? And I've been limited. Question. Very briefly, is deals not so much with econom e economics, but more with the digital public sphere. So you're talking uh, just now. You're talking about uh, sports billionaires and um, you know uh, film billionaires and so on and so forth. A lot of the technological, or the technological dimension of economics is about perception, digital perception. Do you see fiscal policies? Do you see activism, economic <laughs> activism, as being? <laughs> influential in addressing perceptions of technology. For example, recently India, I think a few days ago, slapped a 30% tax on cryptocurrency and the digital public sphere of value addition. So do you think old attitudes, old fiscal attitudes are determining, uh, will determine a lot in terms of the perception of technology? Thank you. Uh, I'll take, try to address br briefly the two. I'm not aware of the current uh, literature of efficiency, uh, where we think efficiency wage, wages stand. I understand your argument that greater efficiency, let, let me not use the word in a, in a double sense, greater accuracy of monitoring of employees could render efficiency wages, to call them that, uh, redundant and unnecessary. I, I can see the argument. Uh, I, I just don't know what the evidence is on that. So I ask some of my labor economist colleagues, and they would probably know whether they're 
there's evidence, but I don't know. But it's an, inter it's an interesting idea, and if so, it would be another piece of technological fallout. Now, on the role of policy in shaping public perceptions, I don't think that plays. It would be interesting to know what you think, Dan. My sense is that that happens less in, uh, in, 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 in the U.S. I think it's much more that the public perceptions drive the uh, drive the policy. Think, for example, of cigarette advertising. It's not that people decided uh, that cigarettes were bad because the government started to ban advertising. It was the other way around. The government finally got around to banning cigarette advertising after the public had decided that cigarettes were unhealthy and a, and, and a bad thing and a nuisance besides. So I think in uh, all of these, and you mentioned crypto, uh, you, you mentioned cryptocurrencies, I think that's a very interesting issue for all of our economies now. And my sense is that uh, it's much more likely to be the public perception driving the policy than the government suddenly banning cryptocurrencies and therefore the general public thinks these are a bad thing. But this, this may be a uniquely American view. I don't think we take leadership from our government very well outside of wartime and things like that. Think, think for, think for example, the outstanding example would be in the 1920s when we had not just a law but a constitutional amendment to ban uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, this did not shape public opinion very, very much. So, there, and there are lots of examples of that. We could go on a lot longer, um, but um, this is, in fact, the time we have to come to an end. I want to thank Professor Benjamin Friedman for a really fascinating talk, uh, a lot of food for thought, and you're going to have to come back and do part two of this. Thank you. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>